Are you serious? So it's Marcus Bronzy here from How to Kill an Hour. Thank you in advance for killing some time with us on today's show. I'm going to be joined by Danny Brocklehurst, a gentleman who is very talented and has provided some great content for us television watchers over the years. I've definitely killed time many an hour watching television over the last few years. I'm not the first person to admit that on the show. Um, he's as well as co-creating Shameless. Danny has also won BAFTAs. Emmy award-winning screenwriter he is. He's also worked on some of the biggest dramas across the last few years, including Clocking Off, Talk To Me, The Stranger, and of course, Brassic, which we're about to talk about on today's show, season two to be specific. I'm going to play a trailer for you, then we're going to have a chat. The famous spy. The six of us, Jim. But the famous six, then. I'm alive. You need to get back to Robin again. It's only 10K. Nice ride. Friday. My Friday. My Friday. Bye. But I think we've established how long we've got. We're professional thieves. <laughs> Ish. We're moving up all in here. Jeez. Danny, that sounds action packed, mate. <laughs> that trailer's just got a lot of explosions in it, hasn't it? <laughs> Which is fair to say, television. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I think it's fair to say there are a lot of explosions in the show. Um, but yeah, thank you very much for bringing us season two of Brassic. But for starters, how would you describe it? When someone asks you what Brassic is like, what do you say? Well, it's 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 a it's a fun comedy drama um, about a group of friends who are sort of in their thirties and have never left their little town in the north, and they've drifted. Some of them have drifted into a kind of quite really quite petty crime, um, just as a way of of making ends meet, really. Uh, but it's you know. It, in the spirit of something like Shameless, or even to some degree, you know, something like Only Fools and Horses, it's it's about some guys who might be, you know, they might be slightly on the wrong side of the law, but they're they're very lovable characters, and it's it's a show about friendship and love, really. Yeah, it is, and a bit of nicking as well. I like bit of nicking, <laughs> bit of, you know, bit of selling weed on the on the side. Exactly. Yeah. So we, we in, during the show we follow Vinny and his crew what happens in season two what can you allude to us happening in season two because because season one is quite action-packed and it has quite a dramatic ending doesn't it yeah um you know and, and anybody who, who hasn't seen it should, should catch up on season one Definitely. but uh, just in just in case uh it's <laughs> it it ends Vinny gets into uh, a lot of hot water let's say at the end of season one and and for various reasons has to fake his own death to uh to avoid um this sort of you know this scary character so we pick up on th- that in season two it's it's several months later Vinny has been living pretty much self-isolating actually in a weed shed um and he's not really been you know he's not really been doing what he normally does he's not been seeing the lads and and then the, the the guys want to open a club uh, and need some money and they have to get Vinny back out working with them again. And with that, we kind of launch into season two from there. Um, and it's, you know, it's very much in the tone of the first series, but I did want to be slightly more ambitious and just to push it a little bit further second time around. I think you definitely, I mean, I've, I've been lucky enough to watch a few episodes in, in season two, and I feel like you definitely did manage to take it to the next level. One thing I felt after watching the first season was this is great. And to be fair, the way you wrote this, it wrapped itself up quite neatly and it had a cliffhanger where it could go somewhere. But I thought, you know what, this is perfect as it is. And, and my concern when you kind of have a second season of something like this is how do you kind of continue the energy or how do you come back bigger and better and, and better and i feel like you've really done that but um there's also some truth oh, oh, no no honestly you have but there's also some truth behind the characters when you've that you've written into this show right and that's kind of where joe plays into the production of brassic right yeah absolutely i mean look you know this was this this whole show was joe's initial idea um he had some of these characters and some some ideas for stories that that were from his past and you know and really funny stuff but also he puts so much of himself into the show he puts his own bipolar and mental health issues into the show and um 
in series two, you probably haven't got this far yet because it's deep into the series, but the stuff to do with his father, who um, is an alcoholic that we deal with. Um, you know, I mean, it, look, it's a fun show and there's a lot of funny things happening, but it is a comedy drama. And at times, particularly as we get deep into the series, there are more more sort of poignant emotional moments. And, and I think Joe always pushes that. He always wants us to go to a place that feels emotionally truthful. Um, and he gives a lot of himself in his own life, uh, sometimes sometimes too much, I think, but, you know, he really <laughs> lays himself bare. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that definitely comes across. And I, I, I believe during the writing process, when I've been reading around this, is Joe actually tried to, he's very dyslexic, I can relate to that, tried to actually, you know, write some coherent stories for the first series. But he kind of, I f he says he handed you like a book, which is, you know, papers with post-it notes and stuff stuck to it. How, what was the process like taking, you know, the ramblings of a gentleman who, who self-confessed <laughs> isn't a good writer. How was it like, like taking that and actually making it into something that has a really nice story arc? It's got great interwoven characters who, who even some of the characters that we see quickly on, on screen for a few moments, the lines that they have really punched through. How was that process? It was, it, I mean, listen, it was a great process um, because, you know, normally when I'm creating a TV show, I'm creating it from scratch on my own. Yeah. And that yeah. is quite, sort of quite heavy lifting. So it was brilliant to have a kind of partner in crime. And also Joe, you know, I think because Joe had thought about this show um, for so many years and had sort of jotted things down and had these like funny characters and funny ideas. I mean, it, it, uh, he would be the first to admit it wasn't, it wasn't a fully formed thing. You know, it was a rough diamond and it needed, yeah. it needed me to come along and, and shape it and help him turn it into a TV show. But undoubtedly, you know, undoubtedly, the, the 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 kind of raw material that Joe had was was amazing, and it made it so much more fun to collaborate with him and and to to bring this thing to life. And uh, you know, I think I think at its at its most truthful moments, that's because that's that's the place it comes from. It comes from real life to some degree. Yeah, and and you're somebody who is from the northwest of England, right? And the show is based yeah. there as well. How important was that kind of heritage of yours when you're kind of exploring the areas like Chorley and, and Lancashire? Yeah, I, I think it would have been difficult to do this show uh, if you didn't if you didn't sort of know the areas that we're setting it in. Uh, yeah. You know, I mean, me, me and Joe are both, um, you know, northern lads and we know this, we know this area pretty well but I think more important than that perhaps is that we both saw the show the same way and we both have the same kind of sense of humor and, and the same you know aspirations for it and and you know it's it's a particular tone Brassic it's it's not something that every show does you know we are we, we're quite sort of raucously funny at times we're sometimes you know sometimes very silly but then also there's this this other thing going on where you know, we're dealing with some quite big themes and uh, series one did that and series two, as it goes on, does it does it as well, you know? So you, you, yeah. you are kind of having to walk a delicate tightrope sometimes between really quite big laughs and, and sort of silly things uh, and fun and then, you know, a story about alcoholism or um, about mental health or whatever it be, you know? Yeah, well, I mean, what's, how, how do you approach that? As, as a writer, because somebody, you know, you've done something like The Stranger, which is, a uh, you know, definitely not comedy. Is it fair enough to say that? Right? <laughs> I think that's fair enough. Fair enough to say. So when you're writing stuff that's funny and you've got scenes backed up against, like you said, they're really big, serious issues. How do you how do you get into that? How do you get around that and negotiate in and out of that in a way that doesn't feel like you're just slapping them together? Because it's quite smooth when you watch the show. Yeah, you have to do it carefully. Um it's not, it's not something that a lot of shows feel comfortable with. Um, but I've got to say, for me, it's always been my favourite tone. You know, I, I have, I, I grew up watching things like uh, Alfida Zayn Pet or, <laughs> um, you know, Mind or whatever it was. You know, which I think, you know, if you if you look back on on particularly Alfida Zayn Pet, it was. It was a funny show, but at, at its at its heart, it did have 
this really important stuff going on, you know, about Thatcher's Britain, about unemployment, about loneliness. And, you know, and, and I, it's, a, it's a tone that I've always felt very comfortable with. So I've done it in quite a few shows now where, you know, be it, be it shameless or be it um, sorted, a show I did years ago or, you know, whatever, uh, even ordinary lies to some degree. I, I don't mind mixing comedy and drama. And I find that I, I, there's, the, the audience respond really, really nicely to it if you get it right, you know. Yeah, they definitely go hand in hand when you when they're written well. I mean, sometimes I feel like it's it it just doesn't connect with me. But there's something about watching Brassic when I when I went to watch the first episode, I really wasn't sure how it was going to come across because you can kind of watch trailers and read about things and mm. they kind of are a different experience. But you kind of do in each episode. There's laughs in there, you know. There's 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 funny old local men at the pub doing you know random <laughs> things, you know, in scenes like you know urinating or whatever and then you'll have like a, <laughs> a really serious plot line running literally right next to it and it doesn't feel like you're you know you're making one seem silly when it shouldn't be or you're making the silly thing seem serious when you shouldn't be so yes yeah, that's, that's really really cool i mean with with brassic season season two i think um for those who haven't watched it before how would you describe the filming style i know you were more on the, on the writing side of things but how would you describe the filming the, the filming style so the filming style is, is, is very, very, very unusual for a comedy. Um, and this is something that we did on purpose because mm. it's, it's, it's shot. I mean, first of all, there's, there's, quite, there's, there's, a, there's a reasonably decent budget, um, which is rare in comedy, you know, in comedies and comedy dramas because they're usually done a little bit cheaper than dramas. So we've got, we've got a pretty good budget. We, we shoot it in a style that is made to look like film it's it's got a tiny little bit of uh, cinema scope at the top and bottom of the screen so it's it's kind of in that letterbox style so we also film on very special cameras uh, to give to give a great depth to what's going on because we're shooting in the, you know in these amazing locations up in in the hills um, of the northwest and you know it's, it's a little it's got a little bit of the sort of wild west about it up there you know it can be really quite wild and so, so we wanted it to look a certain way, and, and there was a lot of chat uh, before season one, before we actually made season one, about the way, funnily enough, that the Coen brothers filmed their their uh, films, and mm. it's it's about it's about not shooting all the time in close ups on people's faces. So you you have you you have a lot of people in shot. You have a sort of um, an e epic quality to the way things are framed. And it does it does feel different. It's a very strange thing. The audience wouldn't necessarily consciously know it, but it does feel different. And it's very colourful as well. It's very bright, you know, to get to give a warmth to the show. So I, I, we, we were very, very... We spent a lot of time working on the way it would look. Um, and therefore, it does feel different to the way other comedy dramas feel. Yeah, it does def definitely look lovely and bright and colourful in certain scenes, which is nice because I'm always used to seeing the UK looking grey. You know, they've got yeah, kind of like, know, you know, desaturated de image. I'm like, come on, no, we have got colour over here, guys. It's not just like, you know, in America. <laughs> um, <laughs> when you say you use special cameras, what kind of special cameras did you use? You know, um, you're asking the wrong man here. I can't I know, remember I know, the name I know, of them. I know, but you said... Um, I, I, can't, I can't remember the name of them, but I know that... Um, what had happened is I'd done a show called Safe for Netflix and we'd yeah. use these cameras. We'd use these cameras um, that just have this amazing depth to them. And it was the same director who did Safe uh, that came to do the first block of Brassic. And we talked about using these cameras again. And, and, and you know, we spoke to Sky and Sky agreed that it would be a good, good way to go. So... I, I honestly can't remember what they're called now, but the, the, they are they are really really good cameras, and you have to shoot in a certain way on them, you know, to to, to maximise the way that they're going to look. And, and and a lot of if you look at a lot of comedy comedy on television, um, it is shot in quite a boring way, you know, and that's fine yeah. because sometimes you're just relying on sometimes you're just relying on brilliant performances, you know, brilliant. Um, actors and that's good enough you know but if you look at some some comedies that have been very successful they are quite boringly shot yeah yeah and uh brassic definitely isn't it's definitely got some no. uh some some awesome shots in there and yeah like there's a few and this isn't going to spoil it, i think there's a there's a few scenes where 
you're just like you said you, you don't always shoot like how, how people would presume you would so there's some nice wide shots where you just see like sunlight kind of coming into the camera and you know solar flares and stuff and it's nice to just have a a, a still shot in there that looks really really good uh anyway uh, so on to something that is probably a bit more of your forte right uh we're gonna yes. do a little bit of future gazing here now danny so you know we're all in lockdown across the world it's, it's no secret how do you think this is going to change the way people consume the stuff that you write oh my word there's a question um <laughs> <laughs> don't know i mean you know i think i i think at the minute um people are looking for lighter more diverting material uh, so i'm really glad that at the minute i haven't got a very very grim heavy depressing drama going out yeah, because good I think that would be wrong that would be yeah so it's good that i've got a show going out that's, that's kind of fun and and life affirming uh, you know, moving forward, it's it's really hard to tell. I mean, it, it sort of depends how the world changes, really. And and you know, I mean, I think I think when when eventually um, we are allowed to go out again, you know, I, I wonder whether people will want to watch television at all because they'll be so so sick of being in their house that they probably just want to go to the pub. <laughs> but it, yeah, it is quite it's 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 a really difficult one. You know, we we would I was just looking at some. A script that somebody else had written for Brassic Three. Um, uh, my, uh, you know, I don't write them all, um, mm -hmm. and and there were some references in it to, you know, to face masks and PPE and this kind of stuff. And I was like, ah, oh, that's that seems so weird. I don't know. Will we, you know, will will we be talking about that stuff in a year or not? I don't know. I guess we will, but it's really hard to. It's just hard to know, isn't it? Looking it is, forward, it is a few a few months. Yeah, it is. It is because I've just, I've just. It, the reason I asked you the question is because so much of what we're consuming is obviously at home. So when you're writing, I was wondering how much of the process is you kind of thinking, right? Okay, where's my viewer watching this from? Do you know what I mean? Because it's definitely not going to be anywhere other than you know a TV screen or or, or a. a screen yeah, I mean, the, the weird thing about television, it all takes so long to make. So even stuff that I'm writing now, you know, even if we could film it even if we could start filming tomorrow which we very much can't um it wouldn't it wouldn't be on a tv screen for a year anyway you know because mm. everything takes so so uh damn long to make so it is weird in under these circumstances to, to know you know when the, the things we're writing now um what what should we put in you know i mean i i've written shows where i've referenced brexit um, but will we, you know, will we need to sort of be saying, oh, well, when the pandemic was on, you know, such and such, I don't know, maybe we will. Yeah. I mean, it's such a massive thing. We can't really ignore it. Yeah. Yeah. It will be very interesting to see. And did I hear you mention in season three as well then Danny already? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's, 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 I've got, you know, I've got to really take my hat off to sky. They have been <laughs> so, so amazing on this. You know, they commissioned the second series before the first had gone out. They commissioned the third series before the second's gone out. I mean, this is unheard of, really. It's it's very mm. unusual. Um, well, it's not unheard of, but it's 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 rare. It's rare, you know. And it shows a real confidence in in the show. And 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 you know, I applaud them for that. Definitely. I mean, and, you know, yeah, well, rightly so. And and you know, applaud yourself as well. I mean, it, it just goes to show that what you're putting out there is there's great demand and great confidence in it. But what I was kind of angling for was season three. I mean, season two is has not even been watched by the majority of the people that are listening to this now. But I mean, what, what can you what can you give us at the moment? What can you tell us? Be honest, if you can't. <laughs> well, I mean, we're still writing it. You know, it's 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 right. kind of it's kind of early days. But um, but I, I yeah, I mean, it's difficult to talk about season, <laughs> season three when you, when when series two is not even on the uh, on the screens yeah. yet. But but yeah, I mean it. I think all I can say is, you know, for me, I don't ever want to tread water with 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 shows. You know, you, you see things come back year after year and they're kind of the same. You know, they're yeah. just kind of the same thing. And that's fine. People like familiarity. But I think you've got to keep moving it on. And it's a bit like it's a bit like for musicians, you know, when when they do the next album, people do want the same. But they also want you to move it on a little bit as well. And, 
you know, that's they, they talk about the diff, is it the difficult third album or the difficult second album? I guess they're all second difficult. album, yeah. But yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, we're on the difficult third season well, you now. Just, but, yeah, you breeze um, through the second, you're fine. Yeah, so I think it's we, we've sort of moved it on a little bit again, yeah. but you know, you, you've got to keep you've got to keep moving on, but but take the audience with you. Definitely, definitely. And um, I think our audience will definitely enjoy season two of Brassic. And, and, and like we said at the start, if you haven't seen the first season, you're in for a treat. Get those episodes in your system and then, yeah, crack on uh, watching the rest on Sky. How about you? How, when, during lockdown, how have you been spending your time? I mean, writing doesn't need an office. I don't know how you used to write before, but how's that affected things? Yeah, it's a strange one, really. I mean, in lots of ways... Uh, things aren't that different for me because I, I still sit on my own all day writing, you know, pretend people. Um, I mean, it's unusual because my kids are around. So that's, you know, there's a little bit of a n- nice distraction to, to have the kids around more. Um, but yeah, a writer's life is quite is quite isolated anyway. So, you you, you know, I'm, I'm probably better prepared for being on my own, um, you know, locked in than, than a lot of people. But having said that, you know, what was what what was great prior to all this is that then I could at the end of the working day, I could then go out and see people and go to the pub or go to the gym or whatever, you know, whereas no, you can't do that. So, yeah, it's it, it, it's it's similar in the daytime. But then um, obviously, you know, I feel a lot more locked in of an evening. Fair enough. And how are you killing your time when you're not writing at home then, Danny? Uh, well, just you know, I've got two kids. That's, that's <laughs> <laughs> I have to say no more. I have to, yes, I have to. Uh, I have to make sure they're, uh, you know, they're exercising and doing all kinds of, you know, other things, um, or, or you know, obviously, or, or watching other people's TV programs. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. How old are the kids? They are twelve and seven. So, oh yeah. Okay. Cool. So the twelve-year-old yeah. probably can do a little bit more by himself, but the seven-year-old, I feel they're going to be you're going to be hearing dad quite a lot. Yeah. Yeah. I know. <laughs> I'm, I'm 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 amazed. I've managed to do this um, this chat without uh, somebody shouting me. To be honest. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the great thing is that's kind of become the norm now. So if somebody, if you're having a chat and somebody's, I, I was on um, uh, a <laughs> Zoom the other day and somebody's kid walked in the room and said mum can, can you wipe my bum bum please and, I, and they were like yeah I've got to go and I was like yeah you've got to go and wipe the bum bum it's cool we're, we're, we're used to it now so uh, that's an interesting thing that's kind of come up now but um, no thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us Danny I, I really oh, appreciate thank you, you letting us know all about what happens in, in Brassic season 2 and also letting us know that there's a season 3 coming as well I had no idea that's a, that's a great thing to hear um, make sure you, you grab all the episodes they're out on Sky now I think by the time this episode's out. So yeah, make sure you uh, have, have, have a watch. Um, and yeah, like I said, I appreciate you, you, you coming on the show. Is, where can we find you online, Danny? Where should we look out for your musings and your social media posts? Oh, you know, I, I, I'm on Twitter, but I don't, you know, I, it's mainly just blatant self-promotion of uh, the TV shows and things Standard. like that. <laughs> yes, I'm ranting about um, Donald Trump. You know, that's pretty much my uh, Twitter output. So you are basically the majority of Twitter self <laughs> promotion, <laughs> promotion and, and ranting about <laughs> ranting about politics. Pretty much, yeah. 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 <laughs> All right. Well, well, thank you very much for coming on How to Kill an Hour. We'll make sure we put links to the show in the description. Brilliant. Um Yeah, I hope you have a great time, man. And, and I look forward to talking to you about season three and four of Brassing. Awesome. Thanks for having us on. 